yeah, just a quick introduction about myself. Okay, wait a minute. I need a bit more screen real estate. So I'm going to close out some of those things. Yep. So my name's Yong Yang, or you can just call me YY. All right. So I'm from SG Code Campus. All right. I don't really have a slide with me. So I'm just going to use this sketchbook as my tool to present my materials, right? So um, I'm a Malaysian and I'm working here in Singapore right now. And I welcome all of you here. Uh, it's, it's nice to see all of you from different ASEAN countries here to learn about Python. Okay, so what we're gonna have for the next five days, actually six days, five to six days, right? Is to introduce the idea of programming with Python to you guys, right? Assuming all of you are beginners, right? Okay, so without further ado, let's take a look at Python as a whole, right? So um, let's just show you the website for now. Sorry. So let's take a look at Python. So this is Python or Python, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Um, it is created by this man called Yido Van Rosham, right? So just a bit of backstory about Python, right? So this guy named Guido, he wants to create a programming language that's easier to understand, all right? And easier to learn for the general public, okay? And some of them speculate that, hey, how would this Python name come about? Is it when he's trying to come up with this new program, was he bitten by a Python or did he saw a Python somewhere when he's thinking about this programming language, right? But uh, the truth is, he's actually watching this show called Monty Python, right? Which is actually a group of comedians, all right? And he come up with this idea of using Python as the name of the programming language. Okay, so let's take a look at the sketchbook again. All right, so we call Python a high level, oops, using the wrong pen, all right? Python is usually called a high level programming language. All right, so I'm going to describe a bit, I'm going to talk a bit about why is it called a high-level programming language, right? So programming language being a language, it is used to communicate between two different parties, right? So among us, we have human language, like your English, your Chinese, um, Vietnamese, and all sorts of different human language, right? And on the other hand, right, when we want to communicate with uh, machines, there is also machine with their own language, which is machine language, okay? And it comes with all the assembly language and stuff, all right? So to bridge this gap between a human language and a machine language, all right, we came up with something called the programming language, right? So this programming language is like a translation between human language to uh, machine language, right? A language that both human can understand and machine also can understand, all right? So if it's closer to the machine language, all right, that means if this language that is used as a translator is closer to the machine language, it's what we call a low level uh, programming language. Okay, so when it's called a high level programming language, it is closer to the human language, all right? And as we learn to code with Python later on, you'll understand why is it very close to human language, right? The words that they use, all right? The choice of sentences, all right? All of them are very close to human language. Okay, I can see that the chat is actually <laughs> increasing uh, in number, all right? I will answer your questions every 30 minutes, all right? Because this is a webinar, I will attend to your questions every 30 minutes, okay? So um, with that said, to learn Python, we must first have an environment to code in Python, right? So generally we need something called the IDE. Okay, your integrated development environment, All right? So in simple terms, it's like when you want to build a car, you need a workshop right, where a workshop has all the tools necessary to build a car. So if you want to code in Python, if you want to create something in Python, you need to have an environment that is equipped with Python tools, right? So usually this is done by installing Python on your computer. And because I'm not sure if you're using a Mac OS or a Windows OS, the easiest way to go around this is to have a common ground where all of us can use, all right? So the easiest way is to actually go to replit.com 
All right, I'm actually gonna paste this link in the chat so that all of you can uh, visit this site together. Ooh, Bio circles, cool. <laughs> yes, most of you know it's Monty Python, very cool. All right, so yes, replit.com. Okay, so basically what's happening over here is this is a website where we can code in whatever language that we want, right? So they, um, they have a variety of IDEs available and one of them is actually Python, okay? So once you are here, you need to click on start coding. All right, and then you will get this page where it get, uh, ask you to sign in with your own account, right? So over here, you can choose to sign up using your Google, your GitHub, your Facebook account, right? It's perfectly fine. Or you can also key in your own username, new email account, and a password to sign up with uh, repl.it or replit, that new name, okay? So I have signed up with this, so I'm just gonna click on sign in with Google. And I'm gonna select my own email. And then I'm in. Okay, all right, so, oh yeah, I'm jumping things a bit quick over here. So just a quick um, brief on this camp. Um, so today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday as well, uh, sorry, Friday as well, eh? is it Friday? Oh, Thursday as well, right? So for the next four days, right? We're gonna have three hours per day, correct? But chances are, all right, it may not stretch all the way to three hours, right? So the three hours may end up earlier, right? We may end at maybe two hours and 30 minutes or two hours and 45 minutes, depending on the speed of, uh, depending on the speed of the class, right? And every one hour, I will give you guys about five to 10 minutes to take a break, right? Go for your toilet break, your water break, and then stuff like that, right? Stretch around, right? Sitting in front of the computer for too long, it's not good for your body, okay? And I will also attend to the chat Right, every 30 minutes or so to answer any questions that you may have as I go along the way. All right. Okay. Uh, and we will program using REPL. Okay. So there's a bit of things that I want to explain before we move on to coding with Python. All right. Some of you may question why do we choose Python in the first place, right? Oh, this is an AWS hackathon program training. It's a training program, right? Why do we start with Python? Why don't we just start straight to AWS Management Console, right? So to answer to that question, um, I'll just use my sketchbook again, all right? Why do we learn Python in the first place? Is because Python in general, all right, is actually easier to learn, all right? It's very, um, it's very close to human language, right? It is a high level programming language. So it's easier to learn, uh, write, and to read as well. And it's also one of the fastest growing programming language. All right, very popular. Okay, now, how popular is popular? Okay, don't take my word for it, right? We just look at some of the stats, right? So there is this website called TIOB, depending on how you pronounce it. Some of it call it TIOB. Some call it Tiobi, I call it Tiobe, right? So depending on how you pronounce it, right? So this is a website that actually collects information from around the world through Google search engine, Bing search engine, and whatever search engine there are to get a sense of how popular is some of the programming languages around the world, right? In the global community. So the index for June 2021 is in, and they found that Python as a programming language has increased in 3.48% compared to last year, right? So around the world, 11.84% of the programming community is using Python, all right? As compared to the top language, which is C, right? The changes is a negative of 4.65%, right? So there are less and less people using C, all right? Not to say that C is not a good programming language, it's just that Python is picking up faster. Right, and then there are various other programming languages ranked based on their popularity, right, globally. Okay, we have a lot of different, different, different ones. And in my school, right, so in SG Code Campus, we actually teach kids on Scratch as well. So Scratch is actually considered a programming language as well, right? Even though it's block-based, it is still a programming language, right? It's a very good tool to teach kids. And it's actually positioned at 22, not too shabby, 
All right? And not just on Tube Index, all right? Let's take a look at Stack Overflow, right? One of the more popular websites where programmers would post their questions and answers in this website, right? So according to Stack Overflow, let me just zoom in a bit because it's a bit small, all right? Python questions has grown throughout the years, right? So this is Python, right? It has increased all the way up to like close to 16% of the questions asked in the website, on the website is Python related, all right? Oh, it used to be C Sharp, right? C Sharp used to be one of the more popular uh, programming languages that have questions being asked on Stack Overflow, but now it has dropped across the years, right? So what does this tell us, right? This tells us that if you have any problem with Python, chances are someone has already answered it before, right? So it's pretty secure to learn Python right now, right? You don't have, you, you won't have the opportunity where you, oh, you face a problem and no one has faced this before, right? Chances are people have faced it before and there are solutions on the internet, okay? So it's very encouraging for us to learn Python. Okay, other than that, Python is also used as one of the languages in uh, AWS SDK packages. Okay, so SDK stands for Software Development Kit, right? So let's say if you want to create your own software and you want to use some of uh, the Amazon Web Services, all right, inside your package, you can use Python to decode it, all right? So import some of the, the SDK over, or you can also use um, some other languages, right? But that's up to you to decide, right? For for us, we think that Python is one of the easier language to learn as the first language, so we brought it up in this training program. Okay, all right. So, also another heads up is this is supposed to be a beginner-friendly bootcamp, right? That means it's for total beginners in Python. If some of you have learned Python and expect something more advanced, like regex, we're not gonna do that. Um, your comprehensions, mm, nope. We are also not going to do that because it's more confusing things. Uh, we are also not going to cover, what is the next thing that's difficult in Python? Some of the things like polymorphism, operation overloading, some of those things are not gonna be covered in this course, right? But what we are gonna cover is your data types, okay? Or also call your classes, right? Uh, and OOP, we're gonna cover this at the end of the camp, we are gonna cover the data structures, like your list and your dictionaries, all right, maybe a bit of sets. And we are going to cover the control flow, how we write conditions and if statements and loops to actually control the computer's uh, operation. Excuse me. And we will also learn how to write our own functions Right, we will write our own functions as well, or as well as learn how to get functions from other people's modules. Right, so Python is a fast-growing community, and there are a lot of functions that has already been defined by other people. We just need to learn how to use it. Right, how to get it from them, and what else? Yeah, that should be it. So at the end of this five days course with me, right, you should be able to do most of these things with Python. Right now, would that make you a Python expert? Um, it probably would not get you to be an expert level, but you have something to begin with, right? You have something to start off with, right? It gets you started in Python. And just to give you a feel of what you can do with Python, recently I've just built this very simple game using Pygame uh, library. So Pygame is a module that is written by some other people, right? Pygame, right? We're going to explore module soon. Um, just to give you a... Uh, a taste of what can be done using Python. And yeah, this is just a simple Pong game that is written using Python. Well, not the most sophisticated multi-million dollar project, but it is something to get you started, right? And just to give you a quick look of the language that we are using, this is Python, right? As you can see, it is very English, okay? But of course, this is using Visual Studio Code. We are not going to use Visual Studio Code today. We are just going to use Rapid. Okay, so that's it for the introduction so far. Let's go straight to learning how to code on Python, right? At this point, most of you should have gotten your REPL up. Okay, you can click on New REPL 
and create the ID of your choice, right? So there are various languages available, as we said, uh, as I said earlier, okay? Um, we're not gonna use any of them. We're just gonna do Python, right? So select Python, right? Make sure your language is Python. And the title of your project, you can just put it as AWS um, training day one, all right? And just click on create REPL. <clears throat> and then just wait for it to create the environment. All right, so this is also an idea of cloud, right? So basically what's happening over here is somewhere on the internet, they have just created an IDE for us to program on, all right? And we can program this from anywhere around the world, right? So this is the beauty of cloud. Okay, that's something that we're going to cover later on in this cam as well. Okay, once you have run the REPL, you should be able to see something like this, right? Where you have your files on your left. Okay, currently we only have one file, which is the main.py. And this is where you write your code. Okay, I will usually call this the code editor, right? This is where we write our code. And this is your console, all right? This is where you see all your output. All right, and you have a run button that's on top. Okay, this allows you to run your code. All right. <clears throat> okay, now I've seen some messages. So let me just have a quick look at the chat and see are there any questions asked? Oh, yes, just set it to public, it's fine. I guess private needs to be paid. Yeah, thanks everyone for answering the questions. Wow, cool. Yeah, machine language is more or less like one and zeros. Swift. Um, Swift is also a very cool language that is developed by Apple. <clears throat> and Swift is actually picking up in population, uh, not population, sorry, popularity as well, sorry. Okay, so yeah, you can use your own account if you have a replicate account. Where do we download the record session? It will be on the app. The hackathon website okay we'll show you the website maybe later on okay so let me go back to coding on repo all right so today's the first day of uh python all right let's do something easier okay usually when a programmer wants to learn a new program like programming language the first thing that they will want to do is to get the language to actually print out hello world not kidding, right? It's all it's almost ritual at this point, right? So when you learn JavaScript, you learn C or you're in C, right? The first thing you want to do is to print hello world, right? So in Python, it's very easy. We just need to call the function print. All right, with a bracket, and we can do quotation marks, hello world. All right. I'm gonna explain why we use quotation mark later on. Okay. And we just click on run and you should be able to see hello world on your right. Now, if my screen is a bit too small, do let me know on the chat, okay? Then I can zoom in. Oh. How do you make your replit to dark team? Okay, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere, oops, not here. Somewhere here. One of the settings, you can go explore around, all right? I forgot how I made it to dark team. Okay, so let's come back to having this code. All right, so print is what we call a function. All right, you will see this word quite often later on. All right, this is what we call a function. And to actually call a function, right? When we run, when we use a function, right? We call it call, okay? This is me calling a function, all right? So I'm just introducing some technical jargons over here. So when you call a function, you must always use a bracket. All right, so this is a syntax. It's kind of like when you use full stop or comma in your English language, right? You want to break down your sentence or to tell the user that, hey, this is the end of the sentence, right? When we use a bracket, this is me telling the computer, hey, run this function, all right? Now, what happens if I don't have the brackets? Okay, let's see if it still works. Okay, I run it. Okay, it will have invalid syntax, right? So whenever you see this error, okay, 
syntax error, invalid syntax, it is telling you that, hey, the computer doesn't understand the structure of your sentence, right? You need to either put in some punctuations, like in this case, we are missing brackets. So we need to put in back our brackets, right? Now, understanding error is the first step of solving problems in your code. As programmers, you will always come into having these problems, right? We call these bugs, right? Any errors are called bug, and the only way to remove them is to debug, right? And the first step of debugging is to actually find out what is your error, right? Know how to read your error messages, okay? Python is very friendly in this regard because it actually shows uh, <clears throat> quite a bit of information on what is necessary to fix your code, right? It's telling you that, hey, there is an invalid syntax, right? And even point the position for you, right? On line one, okay? It is telling you the number of lines that's having this problem, okay? So <clears throat> let's fix this by putting in our brackets. Okay, now, if you want to leave a comment for your fellow programmer, let's say you have a very long code and you want to describe to your friend that, hey, this is the set of code that helps you print hello world, right? I want to describe the code, all right? Now, how do we actually write a comment in Python? Is by using your hashtag, okay? So hashtag allows you to type in your comments, all right? The following line, Prince, hello world. Okay, <clears throat> the moment the computer sees a hashtag, all right, it will ignore the words that's behind it. All right, the whole sentence that's behind the hashtag will be ignored by the computer, right? So it's like me telling the computer, hey, this line is not for your eyes, right? It's for human eyes only. All right, it's what we call commenting. <clears throat> comment okay now there is a shortcut to actually toggle the commenting sentence all right let's say if you don't want to just you know purposely go in front to put a hashtag and stuff right you want to toggle it um, on mac os it is your command plus question mark button all right on windows os it is your control key plus question mark okay so when you do it you are actually toggling the comment of the line, all right? If you want to toggle a few lines at the same time, you can just highlight the two lines or the few lines that you want to toggle on commenting and do the comment toggle, all right? So all the lines will be commented out. Now, this is a very useful skill because sometimes when you have a very long set of code and you want to just temporarily remove some of the code to debug, Okay, you don't want to erase all of the code, right? Or else you may forget how to uh, type it out again, right? You just want to temporarily remove it, okay? You would use this command function. Sorry, I wouldn't call it function. Just this command symbol to tell the computer, hey, these lines, can you just ignore them for now? All right, so that's how we do it, right? So when you have a very long code, you want to debug your code, you will use this command function. Uh, sorry, this command symbol quite often, okay? All right, so that's that. Now, <clears throat> for starters of learning um, Python, excuse me, let's learn how to differentiate the different data types, okay? So generally, there are three general data types that we are gonna work on very often, right? So there are three general types. <clears throat> so let's say we have, the first type is called string. Right, the second type are your numbers. And the third type are your booleans. Okay, I'm gonna go through one by one, all right? Um, first thing first, right, what are data? Okay, so data can be various information, right? Your name is a data. Your age is a data. Your email address, housing address, your billing, uh, your number of hair, if you, are interested, right? Those are information, right? And they can be categorized into different types, okay? For example, all right, your name is actually a string, right? So I'm gonna change my color a bit. So let's say, for example, my name is Yong Yang, all right? Can you see that I'm actually using a quotation mark? 
when you use a quotation mark in Python, you are trying to tell the computer, hey, whatever that's inside the quotation mark is a string, all right? So all this is a string, all right? So imagine string as a string of characters, right? So it can be any characters, right? It can be numbers, it can be symbols, it can be a capital letter, it can be a small letter, right? All these can be strings, right? And it is not necessary to use a double quotation mark. You can even use a single quotation mark. Depends on your preference, right? However, if you use a single quotation mark, remember to always end with a single quotation mark, okay? Ah, I'm gonna show you the difference of single quotation mark and double quotation mark later on. Let's move on to the next one, which is numbers. Now in Python and in most programming language as well, numbers are usually separate into two different categories, right? There is integer, right? These are your whole numbers, okay? That means there is no fraction, no decimal places, right? Just whole number like this, eight, all right? And then there is also another type called the floats, okay? Python call it floats. Some other people may call it doubles and stuff, right? So floats are numbers with decimal places. Okay, maybe your 8.8889. All right, these are floats. Okay, um, they have different users. I'll explain later on. And then you have your Boolean, okay, which only have two possible values, right? Booleans are either true or false. Okay, a very good use of Boolean is your daily electronics, right? Most of our electronics are based on Boolean logic, okay? If it's turned on, it is true, right? Like our lights. If it's turned on, uh, sorry, turned off, it is false, okay? Just like your laptop, if it's on, true, right? The state is true. If it's off, the state is false, right? So that's Boolean, okay? You're just on and off, right? There's only two possible values. Okay, now why do we need to learn all these types of data? I always teach my kids this, right? Data type are like food to us humans, right? Um, depending on the type of data that is given to the computer, all right, the computer has a way to manage it or to handle it, right? To operate on it, okay? So different data types have different operators, okay? I'm gonna go through the operators later on. And different data types have different methods as well, okay? They can be handled differently, just like what human did a bit food, right? Different food, we eat with different calories, right? So like sushi, we eat with our hands or chopsticks, right? If you eat sushi with um, spoon and fork, it's a bit weird, but I don't judge, right? It's fine. Um, but yeah, there are certain ways we designate to handling certain foods, right? So that's the same way as computer handling certain types of data, okay? I'm gonna go through the operators real quick on the REPL. So let's go to REPL. And I'm gonna demonstrate a few operators. <clears throat> okay, um, quick explanation of what are operators, right? So operators are like your plus, minus, multiplication, and division, right? It is supposed to take in uh, pieces of information and come up with a new piece of information, okay? Take note of the word, a new piece of information. Operators always give you a new piece of information. Okay, so let's say, for example, I wanna print out a uh, ham plus burger, okay? So when I do this, okay, I will have hamburger joined together, all right? So this is the plus operator that works between two strings, okay? All right, so when you use a plus operator on two different strings, you will join them together, okay? Whereas if you use a plus operator on a number, let's say maybe eight plus eight, okay? Instead of joining them together, all right? It will perform a mathematical operation, which is 16, right? It will reach, give out 16, okay? Because eight plus eight is 16, all right? Now, of course, the minus, the multiplication, the divide will work the same way as it did in real life. However, what happens if I wanna print something like this? ham minus burger, all right? So we say that operators have plus, minus, multiplication, and division, right? Can a minus operator work between two strings? Let's find out. Ta -da. All right, 
it will be shown a type error, okay? And the computer describes this as unsupported operand type for minus, minus sign between string and string, right? This is the computer telling you that, hey, the minus operator does not work between two different strings, right? Hence the type error. So whenever you see this type error, all right, you can just, you just need to check whether your operators is correct. Okay, so for now, I want you to remember that strings and strings, you can only use the plus sign to join them together, right? Um, a fancy word for this, if you guys are interested, is called concatenate. All right, or the easier word is just to join. Okay, and if you realize when I join the ham and the burger together, there are no spaces in between, okay? Simple as simple explanation is because my ham and my burger has no spaces, right? It just join as is. Okay, if you want to introduce some spaces, uh, what you can do is <clears throat> you can maybe add a space between the hamburger. Okay, I can do a multiple join like this, and when I print it, this will give me a hamburger with a space. Okay, or I can just introduce a space inside burger. <clears throat> and I remove this space over here and I run it, this will still give you a hamburger with a space, all right? So a space in a quotation mark is also a character, okay? Important to note, all right? A space is also a character when it's a string, okay? And for Boolean operators, we have and, or, and not. I'm gonna leave that for tomorrow when we are constructing conditions, all right? That's more like your logic gate if some of you have learned logic gate in physics. Okay, so with data types out of the way, let's take a look at variables, okay? When we want a computer to remember something, we need to use something called variables. All right, so imagine this, okay, uh, a computer, has a brain that has several different blocks. Okay, all right. This is just an imagination, okay? It's not exactly how the computer works, but it's more or less an analogy. Okay, when I declare a variable, I'm actually taking out a small piece of the computer's memory, all right, a bucket, and I need to give it a name, right? For example, I want to know the time, right? I want a computer to remember the time. Okay, I give it a name. And this bucket over here will hold the information about the time, right? Let's say for example, now it's 4.36 p.m., right? It may be 16.36, <clears throat> like in hours format, all right? And every time it gets updated, right? Let's say maybe one minute has passed, it will then become 1637, okay? It is in the computer's memory. So whenever you want the computer to remember something, we need to use the variable. So how is variable introduced in Python? Very simple. We just need to give it a name. All right, let's say maybe a name. Okay, maybe just a food. Okay, let's call it food. All right, and we can assign an information to this. Okay, let's say this food is now holding a hamburger. All right, so what I'm actually doing is I am taking out a piece of the computer's memory. All right and I'm calling it food, and I put some information inside, and this information is hamburger. It is now holding a piece of information called hamburger, which is a string, okay? Now, there are certain exceptions when it comes to declaring the name for your variable, all right? So in Python, you cannot start with numbers. No, all right? And you cannot use other symbols aside from underscore, right? So let's say, for example, if you want to do this, one, two, three, oh, sorry. Maybe you want to do uh, things like food, hyphen name, all right? This is wrong, Damn. all right? Because hyphen is used as a minus operator or a subtraction operator in Python, right? So you cannot use it when you are declaring the name for your variable. Similarly, um, what else you cannot do with variable name? Um, yeah, these are the two exceptions that you cannot do with variables. And your variable must be a single word, okay? So let's say, for example, you want to write food space name. This is also wrong, right? It must be a single word, 
Okay, so usually we use underscore to represent the spaces. All right. And when you are naming your variable, it makes sense to name it properly. Okay, so that 10 years down the road, when you look back at your own code and you know that, oh, this, in, this variable is actually holding the information about the food. Okay, if you name your variable with a bunch of nonsense word, okay, chances are when you visit, when you revisit this code in the future, you will not know what's inside this variable. What information is it holding? Okay. And there is a joke in the programming community that says this, right? If you want your company to keep you around, you can name your variables like this so that the company wouldn't know what you're naming with your variable. <laughs> but it's not a good practice, okay? So just, just a joke. Okay, so that's it for variable. You can save all sorts of information in variable. Integers, floats, strings, lists, dictionaries, whatever can be saved in a variable, okay? <clears throat> all right, so... Let's try to initialize some other variables like your numbers, okay? So if you are gonna pr program a game, chances are you will need a variable that holds the score, all right? And to start off with, our score usually starts with zero. When, <clears throat> when your variable is being assigned a value for the first time, it's what we call the initialize. Right, this is an initialized process, right? Initialize means giving it a starting value, all right? And when I talk about initialize, there is one thing to note as well. When I'm using the equal sign, this is not me trying to tell the computer, hey, the score is equals to zero, all right? This is not that meaning, right? When you see this equal sign, this is your assignment operator. We call this the assignment operator. Okay, what do we mean by assignment operator? I am trying to assign a value of zero into a variable called score. Okay, so what you can imagine is the computer will first create a piece of information called zero and then create a variable called score and put it inside to store it. Okay, and every time the computer needs to read this piece of information, right, when it's being referenced, it will be <clears throat> printed out. Okay, let me just try this out. All right, so I'm going to comment all this nonsense first. Okay, let's say if I print score, all right, I am trying to get the computer to print something which is called score, right? The computer will look through its memory and realize that, hey, there is such a variable called score and inside this score, there is a value of zero, all right? And when I print this, zero will be printed out, okay? Simple as that, right? The computer is referencing its memory for this particular variable. And sometimes your variable is not expected to remain the same, right? Sometimes you need to make some changes, right? For example, the time, it is now 441, right? Some changes has been made. Okay, same thing for your score. You don't expect it to be zero forever. So how do you actually update your score? There are a few ways to update your score. All right, so let me just try to write a comment. All right, initialize a variable, okay? And then I will now updating a variable. There are two ways to do this. The first way is to actually update it based on its current score, all right? So when I write it like this, okay, always remember that the computer would evaluate the right-hand side first, right? I will use the word evaluate. Okay, so what's going to happen over here is the computer is going to refer to this variable called score, which is currently holding the value of zero. And then it will take it out and add 50 to it. So obviously zero is a number and adding 50 to it is perfectly legit, right? So you get a new data called 50, right? This is new. Okay, so when this new information is available, right, I assign it into the score again, right? I assign it into the score, okay? Assign using my equal sign, okay? Now, when a new piece of information is being fit into the variable, all right, the old information will be replaced, okay? So now, when I try to reprint it, sorry, not reprint it, I'll try to print it, okay? I will expect 50 instead of zero. Let me show you here. See, 
it is now updated, right? Initially, it is zero, which is printed here. And now I've updated it to 50. Okay, so this is how we update it using a relative method, right? I refer to the current value and then I do something to the current value. Okay, sometimes we call this the relative method. And of course, there is another method called the absolute method. Okay, and this is used when you want your computer to set a specific value to this variable, all right, regardless of the current value. Okay, let's say for example, I reset this game, right? I want it to go all the way back to zero. I don't care whether you're 100 score, 200 score, or 300 score, right? I just want it to be back at zero, all right? So you can just assign a new value to it, all right? This will totally replace the current value. Okay, regardless of its current value. So when I print score again, you will see that it is now zero. Okay, so I am going to take a look at the chat right now to see if there are any problems. By memory, do you mean RAM or the storage? By memory, I mean the RAM. Okay, we don't affect the storage when we are doing programming unless you save your programming somewhere. Okay. Mm -mm. Yeah, for example, the date is 10 and the is 2. Can you concatenate day, month, and year? Oh, interesting. All right, so triple quotes. Yes, you can perform triple quotes command. Not gonna add that much. Set up the vote for me. <laughs> okay. The reason why we need it is because we want to print a string. Yes, Braden, yes. We need to, when you're printing something, it needs, uh, we are printing a string, you need to indicate your quotation mark, correct? All right, some of you actually ask about multiple line command. Um, all right, so let me just do it real quick. If you want to comment a few lines at the same time, all right, you can just highlight the few lines, okay, and depending on your console, oh, sorry, depending on your operating system, right? Whether you're a Mac OS or a Windows OS. For Mac OS, you just need to hold onto command and click on question mark, right? This is me commenting a few lines at the same time. And for Windows, you just need to hold onto control and click on question mark, all right? So that's you commenting on multiple lines. Control question mark, yes, correct. How about constant variable? Constant variable, all right, cool. Since you guys asked about it, if you have a variable that you don't want other people to change along the program, you would rename them differently, all right? Notice how I always rename my variable in lowercase, okay? This is a way of renaming uh, variables, right? Usually people will rename them using camel case or uh, snake case. Okay, I'm just gonna explain both cases, right? So what is camel case? Let's say for example, I have a high score. Um, I'm just gonna comment all of this first, all right? Let's just do this one at a time. So if I want to create a variable called high score, all right, if I do capital letter for the next uh, word onwards, this is what we call a camel case. Camel case, all right? Or I can write it in this stylized method, right? Camel case, all right? However, if I name my variable like this, high underscore score, this is what we call a snake case, right? Snake case means all the spaces are replaced with underscore. All right, um, which is the correct method? Now, both method works, all right? Convention wise, people would like to use snake case for Python, all right? And camel case is usually what they do in JavaScript, but, but, if you are familiar with, jar, with camel case, by all means, use camel case, right? If you're familiar with snake case, it's all right, it's fine, all right? As long as your user understand what is this variable. Okay, and for constant variable, if, let's say for example, uh, a blue color is definitely an RGB of zero, 255 and zero, right? If you don't want people to change the value of your, your variable, you indicate it by having it all capitalized, right? When it's all capitalized, the programmer will understand that, hey, this variable is supposed to be a constant, all right? You're not supposed to change it. You are supposed to use it, but you're not supposed to change it, 
Okay. Are we required to use net case in Python? Um, yeah. Up to you. I like snake case personally. All right. If you like camel case, go ahead with camel case. All right. Control slash. Oh, technically, yes. Control slash is also correct because I look at question mark because slash and question mark is actually the same button. Now, oh, some of you actually want to know about multi line quotation. Hold up. What is constant variable? Constant variable means a variable that is not supposed to be changed. Okay, to concatenate a string with a number is something that I'll teach you next uh, in the next minute or so, right? After I answer all this question. We are going to concatenate a string and a number, right? We need to learn something called a casting function. Now, let me tell you guys about multi-line quotation first. Yes, you have to convert it to string, correct? So let's talk about multi-line quotation. Let's say if you want to print um, hello world and then you want to also print my name is yy okay i don't know why repo is lagging on me maybe i should just close some of the windows okay and i want to print i am handsome okay all right so let's run this you realize that the computer actually runs from top to bottom Right, so it'll run line by line. Okay, the first line that it's gonna run is hello world. The second line is my name is YY, and the third line is I am handsome. Okay, now of course, if you want to do all three lines in a single print statement, all right. Um, okay, I use another jargon over here. Every time we have a line, okay, each line is a statement. All right, every line is a statement. Okay, so this is what we call a print statement. Okay, so if you want to do this within a single print statement, what we can do is we can use triple quotation mark. Okay, I'm just going to write a comment over here, right? Triple quotation mark for multi-line strings. All right, so instead of a single quotation mark like this, I will just do triple. All right, and I don't need this print anymore. I don't need this handsome any this print anymore. All right, handsome still need. And this ending over here, I'll erase, I'll erase. And the end of handsome, I will just indicate triple quotation mark as well to close off the sentence. Excuse me. Remember, when you start with a triple quotation mark, you need to end with a triple quotation mark, right? That's how it works. So when I run this, you realize that, hey, I can achieve the same result, okay? And I don't even need to care about the spaces, right? When I introduce another new line over here and another new line over here, this new line will be printed as well, all right? So triple line will take whatever character that you have indicated as is, okay? So that is triple quotation line. Sorry, not triple quotation line, triple quotation mark, multi-line strings, all right? <clears throat> So that's that. Okay, let's take a look at the chat again. There's one more. Constant variable is a variable that you learn. Yes, correct, Jerome. Okay, so there's no way to enforce constantness. Yes, there is no way to enforce constantness. All right, this is not JavaScript. What if four lines? You can try it out, all right? Experiment with your code. All right, so. One time I crashed rapid because I used Python. <laughs> okay. All right, Ken. So now let's move on to that, um, the next part, which is on, let's see. Oh, operators are done. Okay. Let me just try to remove all this. All right. I am going to assign some information in a variable let's say i have uh, a file or a name okay let's say my name uh, yong yang okay and then we have some information like maybe h let's say 30 okay and mm, okay i guess that's it All right so sometimes you want to check the data type of a, of a certain variable, 
All right, you can use this function called type. All right, and you need to input whatever information that you want to check the data type of inside the bracket. Okay, so let's say if I don't know what is the data type of your name, right? So I just do type bracket name, and then when I run it, I won't get anything. Now, why is this so? It's because type as a function, it returns, it returns a value, okay? It gives you a value, okay? And this value, if you don't save it in a variable or you don't print it out, okay, it is just there in the computer's memory somewhere, all right? And if it's not used, the, comp the garbage collector will, uh, will collect it and throw it away. All right, if the, the value is not used by any means, right? So how do we use it? We can either print it directly like this. Okay, so when I run it, it gives me that it is a string, right? STR stands for string. All right, so you have STR, you have INT, right? It doesn't stand for strength and intelligence for those gamers out there, right? It stands for strings and integers. And there will also be OOL, which stands for Boolean. All right, and you notice that they use class instead. All right, so class and data type, they are the same in Python, right? We'll explain more this Saturday. All right, so when you do this, all right, type, it returns an information and I can print it out. Now, if you don't want to print out directly, let's say you want to save it somewhere first, right? I can save it under a new <clears throat> variable called data type. And then I print my data type. What's going to happen over here is this type function actually gets the class information of this name variable and save it inside a variable called data type first. All right? And when I print it, it refers to this variable and it will show me the same thing. All right, it works that way as well. All right, so let's take a look at the chat. The print console. Slash then is to make, yes, escape character. Slash n, the backslash is an escape character. It's used to create a new line, correct? It's not in C sharp only, it's also in, <clears throat> it's also in uh, Python. You can also do print type name. Yes, you can also do that. Was there 200 people in the meeting earlier? Was it? Actually not, I'm not sure. Okay. So at this point, all right, let's take a short break and we'll come back at casting functions and formatting later on. All right, uh, let's take a quick five minutes break and we'll come back at 5.01. All right, I'm just gonna take a quick water break and toilet break. Stop sharing for a while.
Okay, so I'm going to share screen. Okay, Ricky, I'm going to overwrite your share screen. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. Right, since some of you are interested with the escape characters, right, and I can see that some of you are actually not totally beginners, right? That's good, that's good, all right? <clears throat> all right, so let's see. If you use the backslash character, right, this is what we call the escape character. All right, and it is usually used to tell the computer that, hey, the character that's after the backslash, all right, is not your usual character. What do I mean by that? Let's say, for example, you want to print um, a dialogue. Okay, so let's say maybe Joe say something, right? And Joe, if you want to say something, you need to have quotation marks, right? Then it will say that I want to eat hamburger. Okay, with an exclamation mark. Okay, quotation, quotation. Now, you will realize that eh, the string, I want to eat hamburger, is white in color. And it has this red squiggly line. Right, this is the code editor telling you that there is something wrong with your code. It is not being recognized as a string. Okay, and when I run it, you will get your syntax error. Okay, something is wrong with your symbols, right? And it, every time you see syntax error, something is wrong with your symbols, right? Always remember that. Now, <clears throat> in this case, when we use a quotation mark, right, it's we trying to tell the computer that whatever follows behind will be a string, right? And we have ended earlier here. Okay, this is the string part. Okay, anything that's after that, the computer is confused. What's going on, All right? So if you want to tell the computer that, hey, this quotation mark is not your ordinary string indicator. This is just a quotation mark symbol. You will need to use your escape character, your backslash. All right? So you can see that the color has changed, right? So when you backslash it and you run, you'll be able to see your quotation mark just as normal, all right? But of course, when you have a lot of backslash in your code, it is not very pretty, right? Let's say maybe you want to go to the next line. You also uh, backslash N and then uh, Susan said backslash quotation mark, okay dot backslash quotation mark and then quotation mark, all right? <clears throat> when I run it, yes, you will still get your you will still get your uh, desired output, but from your line of code, it doesn't look too elegant, right? Backslashes are not the most elegant way of doing things, but it gets the job done, right? And there's a lot of different escape characters. One of it is your single quotation mark, all right? You can also backslash a backslash to tell the computer, that, hey, I want to do a normal backslash, right? 
So these are escape characters, right? Just you telling the computer that, hey, the character that's after this backslash is not the usual character. Okay, if you don't want to use these backslashes, then how do you actually use a double quotation mark normally? So the reason why we have both single and double quotation mark is so that we can alternate between it, right? So let's say, for example, I am going to do this. Joe said, all right, I'm going to use a single quotation mark as my string indicator. And inside this conversation, I'm going to use the double quotation mark. All right. <clears throat> okay. And then this backslash N, I'll just keep it here. And then Susan say, okay, as well in quotation marks. And at the end of the day, I will just close it off with a single quotation mark. Okay. And when I run it, it will still print me the double quotation mark, okay? So the explanation is like this. If you are using a single quotation mark as a string indicator, all right, the double quotation mark will appear as just a normal symbol when it's used inside the single quotation mark, okay? Likewise, when you're using double quotation mark as your string indicator, the single quotation mark within this double quotation mark will be just a normal symbol, okay? Symbol as that. All right. Now. Once we are done with escape characters, let's move on to the next part. So some of you ask, how do we actually join strings and numbers together? All right, let's say maybe I want to print, uh, let's say 14 plus years old, all right? Or maybe 18, okay? Then you want to say something like, I am 18 years old. Okay, obviously when you run this, you will get an error because the plus operator is not supported between integer and string. Okay, so there are two ways, actually a multitude of ways to do this. All right, one of the ways is to use casting function. Okay, let me introduce one by one, all right? Casting functions, uh, okay. Casting functions, right? So what I'm going to introduce here is the str and your int. Okay, so what casting function does is this, right? It will cast whatever information that is given to it into a data type of a string or an integer. All right, let's just do a simple uh, exercise over here. So h is 18, right? This one I will just comment it out first. If I do a stir of h, all right, this is me trying to get this h, right, this value, and cast it into a string. Okay, anything can be casted into a string. All right, and once you've casted it, it actually returns a new value, right, just like an operator. Uh, <clears throat> I will need to disable annotation because someone is already drawing on my screen. All right, so it's disabled, perfectly fine. Now, once I have this function done, all right, I will need to save this new information somewhere. Let's say maybe a h string, all right? And when I check this new information's type like this, I will be able to get that, hey, this is now a string, all right? I have cast this into a string. Now, str as a function returns a new value. It does not affect your original value. Okay, let me show you why I say that, right? Let, if I just call the function str bracket h, all right? And I try to print the type of h, okay? You will realize that it is still an integer, okay? It does not affect the original value, right? What it does, it, it simply takes the value out of the variable, all right? I cast it into whatever, info, whatever data type that I want, and then I give it back to you as a new piece of information. Now, since this is a new piece of information, you need to either save it in the variable if you're gonna use it uh, for a few more times later on in the program, or you can just use it for one time in your print function. Okay, or whatever function that you want to use it in, right? <clears throat> okay, so remember this, right? 
casting functions never affect your original variable data. All right, it would just return a new piece of information. Okay, now with that said, okay, let's go back to the top. <clears throat> if I want to make this work, what I can do is I can just str my 18, all right, because I need to only make it into, cast it into a string for once, right? I do need to save it in the variable, right? I just need to do it once to print the sentence, I am 18 years old. And of course, because there's no space, I'll just add a space here to make it look a bit nicer. And I'll be able to print, I am 18 years old. Okay, so far, everything okay? All right, string formatting. Now, the other way to make this easier, all right, without having to know all these like casting functions is to use a string formatting method, all right, which I'm gonna teach as well. And before we move on, let's just show you something else. If I want to use the int, casting function on something that does not have an integer, let's say maybe a potato, you will run into an error as well, okay? Because for the int function to work, it needs to be of a value base 10. That means it needs to be an integer, all right? <clears throat> so when you see value error, that means the value that you've put in for this function is not valid, okay? So you cannot anyhow use int function. String function, perfectly fine, right? Anything can be a string, all right? Integer function, not so much, okay? <clears throat> all right, so just another quick tidbit, right? Since we have str and b, uh, str and int, right? What do you think about bool? Okay, this works as well. So let's try out this bool uh, function. Let's say I have a name that is YY, oops, not plus, YY, I have an H that is 100, <clears throat> okay? And I try to bool this. Okay, let's see if it works. So when I run it, oh, I need to actually print it to show it out on the screen. Okay, so when I run it, aha, true. Okay, it will actually cast whatever information that is inside into a Boolean value, which is either true or false. Now, a quick to note over here. Anything in string, all right, if there is any character at all, it will always be true, all right? However, when there are no information in the string, this is what we call an empty string, all right? Let me just call this empty string. When you have an empty string, it will always be false. Okay, anytime you have a character, let's say maybe a full stop, this will also return true. Okay, that is for strings. Now for numbers, right, for numbers or integers, anything that is not zero will always be true. All right, so let's say maybe your age is oh, 100. Let's say I print the bool of age, 100 will be true. If it's zero, it will be false okay um simple analogy most of you will have known binary right so binary means there are only two states right the word by means there's only two okay like your bicycle there's only two wheels right so binary means there are only two states either zero or one zero means false one means true okay and in python your true and false is actually written with a capital letter t and a capital letter f okay always remember this not the case for other languages, but for Python, it is, all right? Now, <clears throat> remember this, any number that is not zero will always be true, not zero. The moment it is zero, it will definitely be false, okay? And any strings that have some character inside will always be true, all right? Only an empty string is false. Let me just demonstrate one more. Let's see if I have, what about a string of zero? All right, let's run this and see if it's true or false. Ta-da, it will be true. Okay, as long as it is not empty, all right, the string will return true. Okay, this will come into clutch later on when we learn about control flow. Okay, so let's talk about strings formatting, string formatting. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm sure most of you guys would have taken a screenshot and saved your file before and you would have seen your screenshot like this, right? A screenshot underscore, like maybe the today's date, <clears throat> zero 07, and then underscore the time, right? Let's say maybe now it's about 17, 14, and then dot JPEG, all right? I think some most of the program work this way, all right? Some of them doesn't, okay? But we're going to create something like this, right? How do you actually get a computer to automatically generate a date, right, and an hour, and then automatically string everything together? Okay, we will need to use something called your casting function, or we can also use your strings formatting, all right? So let's say, for example, your starting file name will always be, <clears throat> let's say, a start name will always be your screenshot. Okay, then the computer will need to check for the year the month, let's say maybe uh, zero 06, and then the day, which is, let's say maybe zero 07, all right, and then we have your time. Okay, now the moment you, you see that your time is changing in color like this, the computer is telling you that, hey, this name is used somewhere in the program as a keyword. Okay, try not to use it as your variable name. Okay, so in this case, I'm just going to use the, uh, let's call this, I'm gonna call it daytime. Maybe just call it time one for now. All right, and this is like 17, 14. Okay, and then we have your extension, which is your JPEG. <clears throat> so how do we write a single string that can combine all of these together? All right, if we have done, Okay, if you're gonna use the plus operators and stuff, right, it will look like this. Okay, let me show you. Say if I print, um, I will print off starting with my start name, and then I need to plus my underscore, all right, because there is an underscore over here to signify the space. Then I need to plus my year because it is an integer, I will first need to make it into a string before I can plus it together, right? Or else I will have a type error. So I'm just gonna do str year plus, okay, plus str month, all right? Plus str day, all right? <clears throat> and then plus another underscore before I would need to plus the str of time again, right? Time one. And then I need to plus another full stop. And then I need to plus my extension. Okay, quite a mouthful, right? But let's see if it works. All right. Syntax error, leading zeros in decimal places are not permitted. Oh, so we can't start with zero. Oops, so it need to be six. All right, so let's do this, run. Not defined. Let me just remove this. Okay, so it will show something like this. All right, of course, there is no zeros. All right, not very nice. Okay, now if I want to make it work, but with an easier way of writing it, okay, what I can do is to use a F strings, right? What we call the F strings or oh, the F formatting. <clears throat> Let's see. So when you use the F formatting, right, we always start off with the alphabet F, okay? This is me trying to do something called the uh, string formatting. Okay, F strings. <clears throat> all right, so in this F string, all right, it's a very powerful string, all right? Uh, some other languages may call this uh, template literal. Okay, so in Python, they call it string formatting. And I can do something like this. I can print, uh, if it is a variable name like this, I can just use a curly brackets to indicate that what's ever inside the curly bracket is gonna be a variable name, right? So let's say a start name, all right? And because I need to have an underscore, I can just use an underscore just like a normal string, all right? And the year, I will just put it like this, year in the curly brackets, uh, month, 
in curly brackets as well because these are variables. And then we have the day in curly brackets and then underscore normally. And then we have the time, which is time one curly brackets. And then with a full stop or dot and we have the extension, right? The file extension. Okay, so when I print this, it'll be the same as the one above, All right? So what you can notice is I'm using my curly braces to contain the value of the variable, all right? So it will be automatically shown on the screen like this, okay? Year, month, day, and the uh, underscore, because it's just a normal string character, I can just put it, to, put it inside this string formatting as if it's just another character. It works perfectly fine, all right? And this is usually useful when you are naming your files, all right? When you have a variable that's changing and you want to make it into a string without using the casting function, you can just use a string formatting like this. Now, not only can you put variable names inside the curly braces, you can also put in expressions, all right? So let's say maybe I will print something like, uh, like this. <clears throat> um, Two plus two is is equals two. All right. I can put an expression inside the curly braces. Right. Two plus two. Now, what is called an expression? An expression is a set a statement that produces value. Okay. Before this, I mentioned that any one line is called a statement. Right. If your statement is available. Sorry, if the statement can produce a value, let's say in this case, two plus two gives you a value of four, right? It produces a value for you, okay? Or in other words, it returns a value, all right? We call these statements expressions, okay? Any statements that can give you a result are considered expressions, okay? So when you do this, oops. When you print it, it will print out the answer of the expression as well. Okay, so this is a very powerful tool when you're doing some data cleaning or data sorting, right? You use the F formatting to input your expressions. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at some of the chat. Looks like an emoji, <laughs> yes. All right, so with that said, let's move on to the next one which is the input function. So far, we have learned the print function, right? To print something onto the screen, but we have not learned how to get information from our user, okay? So to get information from our user, we need to use a function called the input, All right? Input function. So how does the input function work? Um, if you have visited some of the websites before that requires you to input your information. Let's say, for example, signing on to Facebook, all right, logging into Twitter, all right, there is a space for you to write something, right? And this space is what we call an input. So to do that in Python, all right, we use this input function over here. So how does the input function work? So input function, all right, you will need to write uh, this question, sorry, the question that you want to ask in the brackets. Okay, let's say for example, I want to ask about your age. Okay, what is your age? When I do this, all right, it will appear as a line over here in the question. Okay, where you will need to type in your answer, right? Let's say maybe my age is 18. Okay, when I click on enter, I have returned the 18 back to the computer and the computer would receive it. Now, what do you do with this information? All right depends on how you program it. So this input, when it's being executed, all right, it will keep the computer busy until a certain answer has been given by the user, right? So what do I mean by that? As long as the input has not been answered, the next line will not be printing, right? Your H is, let's say maybe H, all right? I'm gonna save it in a variable soon. Okay, so let me just demonstrate that again. When your input is running, all right, your next line of print will not be executed, but because at this point, the computer is stuck at line 19, all right, 
it will only move on to the next print when you have key in your answer. Okay, so let's say I'm 18 again. All right, we have an error. Okay, this is a new type of error because I have not mentioned about this in class, right? When we have a name error, right? This is you, this is a computer telling you that, hey, this variable name age cannot be found in my memory. I cannot find it anywhere, right? It is not defined. You have not tell me what is it about, right? So what we can do is we need to initialize this variable. All right, we need to create this variable first. And since input returns an information back to us, right, we can actually store it in a variable. All right, so input can be stored in a variable like this. Okay, what's going to happen is this input function will take in the information given by the user and return to the computer as a string. Okay. Let me just put it in capital letters, always return a string. Okay, whatever information that you're putting into the input, it will always be returned as a string. Okay, so when my age is being input into this variable over here, all right, let's say if I put 18, this 18 will be a string. Imagine this, all right, I have a variable called age and the new information is 18, all right? It is definitely a string. Always remember this, all input returns as a string. Okay, <clears throat> so let me run this. Okay, what's my age? My age is 29. I will print your age is 29. Okay, so similarly, you can ask about what's your, what's your name and hi, nice to meet you, something like that, right? Let's say maybe what's your name and then I can print hi, right? Cursive bracket name, of course, must change the variable to name so that it makes sense with curly braces. Nice to meet you. Okay, so it's like me trying to program a autoresponder, right? So the user is going to key in the name and the computer is going to respond by, hi, nice to meet you, right? So if I'm going to run this and let's say, what's your name? My name's Ricky. Hi, Ricky, nice to meet you, right? Something like that. Okay, so. The next part is to demonstrate how the return of input actually matters. Let's say I want to create a program that gets the sum of two uh, numbers. Okay. Mm. Uh, a program that returns the sum of two numbers given. Okay. <clears throat> so I would need to first get the first number from a user, right? So please key in the first number. All right. And I'm, if I want to use this information in the next, excuse me, sorry. If I want to use this information in the future, right? I will want to save this piece of information in a variable, right? So let's assign it to a variable called num1. Okay. Num is usually used as an abbreviation for number. Okay, then we have num2 as an input, right? We will key in, please key in the second number. All right, so what am I trying to do over here is I'm trying to get two numbers from my user to add them together. Okay, so I'm going to comment out all this first, right? All these unnecessary lines. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to get the sum of these two. Okay, so the simplest way to do this is print f strings. All right, <clears throat> the sum of the two numbers given is, all right, in a cursive bracket, I can do num1 plus num2. All right, so what am I doing over here? Right, in this string, I'm going to print the sum of the two numbers given is. All right, an expression that is the addition of these two number. All right, so let's do this. If I run it, I key my first number eight, I key my second number eight, and I run it, it says the sum of the two numbers given is 88. Nani? Obviously wrong, right? Eight plus eight is not 88. Okay, so let's see. All right, chat getting active. Need to convert to integer first. Correct, right? So, yes you will need to convert it into integer first, right? 
there's a few ways to do this, okay? And <clears throat> you will need to either put your INT here, okay? That means you make it into an integer before you save it in a variable, all right? Or you can even put your INT here. Oops, sorry. Wow, what happened? Wow, wait a minute. <laughs> My replet is bugged. Oh, okay, saved. All right. So I can either use the INT over here to cast it into an integer first, all right? Or I can cast into an integer when I'm doing the summation in the F strings. All right, so it works both way. So when I run it, let's see, I put eight, eight again, all right? It will now give me the correct answer of 16, okay? So that's that. Always remember input will give you um, a string in return, okay? So let's see. That is a string. All right, cool. Okay, good that you guys understand, right? Because input as a function, it will always return as a string. All right. Now let's see what other examples that I can give. Mm. Oh, since we are done with input, let's introduce some uh, rather interesting operators. So I've mentioned that you can only use a plus for your string and string operation, right? What happens if I use a multiplication instead? All right, so let's try to do this, okay? I'm just gonna do this for extras because I've basically covered most of the things that I need to cover in day one. All right, so let's go cover some other operators. Okay, let's say if I want to use a multiplier operator between a string and an integer. Okay, this is a very interesting interaction. It's called a duplication. Okay, so if I have, let's say maybe a spam and I multiply it 10 times, right? I will have 10 spams that kind of make it look like spasm in a way, right? And you'll notice that they are all joined together, right? So basically the idea is this, right? I'm gonna create 10 different spam and concatenate them back to back, right? So that's what we are doing over here. Not really useful, but just thought that I would introduce it to you guys as well. Now, um, when you are doing multi, sorry, mathematical operators, let's say your plus, minus, multiplication and division. These are all very common operators, right? So in computer science, we actually have something else, right? That's a bit special. We have your floor division. Okay, so let's take a look at this floor division and exa uh, examine how it actually works. If you have a number, let's say maybe 10, and you floor divide it by three, okay? It will print you, Three. Okay, what's happening over here is when you get a result, all right, or your quotient as 3.3333333 to the infinity, right? The computer would just take the integer portion of it and chop off the rest, right? The rest is being truncated. All right, so floor division will always give you an integer. Now, very important to note, right? If you need an integer, when you're doing a division, you will always use a floor division. Okay, so some of you will think that, yeah, because 3.333 is, this three number is less than five, right? So I round down, I give you three, right? So that's correct. What happens if it's more than five? Let's say maybe a 6.66666. Okay, so let's try to do that. So let's say maybe uh, 30, 38 divided by, wait, is it 38 or is it 37? <clears throat> let's say maybe I give it a random number, 38 divided by six. Would this give me a more than five? No. Okay, oh, anyway, the general idea is this, right? Any decimal places, right, regardless of more than five or less than five, right, will be cut off and you will only take the integer part of it. Okay, that's floor division, all right? <clears throat> okay, so, the other division that is interesting is the modulus operator, okay, which is your percentage sign. Okay, this is your modulus operator. 
And this is interesting because it doesn't affect your quotient, right? Let me spell the quotient. Quotient is like the answer of your division, right? It affects the remainder instead, okay? So what's happening over here when you use the modulus operator is you will perform a division and the computer will return the remainder of it, all right? So let's say if I do a print 10 percentage 3, all right? I would expect to have an answer of one, right? Because 10 divided by three is three with one remainder, right? So it's like three and one out of three, right? So this is the remainder. Okay, it will be printed on the screen. Now, modulus operator can be useful in various ways, right? So let's say, for example, if you want to only obtain the last digit of a certain long number, okay? For example, a barcode reader. Okay, you can get the very long number to be modulus by 10, okay? In this way, you will always get the very last number of your digit, sorry, the very last digit, okay? It will always be four, okay? If I change this to nine, it will be nine, okay? So this is one way of using the modulus operator. The other way of using the modulus operator is when you want to check whether a number, excuse me, is even or odds, right? So a quick way to do this is to percentage it. Sorry, I always use the word percentage to modulus it by two. Okay, if you subject it to two, right? If there is a remainder, which is one, that means this is not even, right? You are not perfectly divisible by two, okay? If it is perfectly divisible by two, let's say for example, this number over here, you will return to zero instead, okay? So this modulus operator is actually a very good check against even and odd numbers, all right? And of course, in some cases where you want to check whether is it a divisible, if it, is it perfectly divisible by seven or eight, right? Whether it's a multiple of seven or eight, you can also use a modulus operator, okay? Something that is new to you guys. All right, and let's see, what else, what else? Mm. I guess that's it for today. I can actually teach a bit about the things that we're gonna ta teach tomorrow on conditions. All right, let's just do a bit of conditions before we end today's class. All right, since it's pretty early, I'll look into the chat for a bit. Can you teach to six? Yes, uh, yes. Let me try to teach to six, okay? Let's stop at six and then I'll answer all those questions. But why use an F? What does the F do? The F will just tell the computer that this is an F string formatting. There are several ways of formatting your strings, but the F is one of the ways. Which buttons to press command off the codes again? Yeah, control slash. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> okay. What time is the next class tomorrow? It will also be 4 p.m. It will always be 4 p.m. except for Friday, which is 7 p.m. and Saturday, which is on 10 a.m. Could you repeat on how to do the multiplication again? Multiplication or duplication? Ooh, someone actually programmed a calculator. Pretty cool. Can we have access to the recorded video? Yes, we will upload it as soon as it after. Yes, Rita, your calculator looks good. Oh, duplication, how can I edit it? Ken, uh, let me just repeat the duplication again for Rinda. Um, duplication is just, wait a minute, it's just this. Right, so when you use a multiplication operator between a string and an integer, right, what's gonna happen is the string is going to be duplicate for a number of times that is indicated as your integer here, and it will be concatenated together, all right? So if you do spam 10, if I run it, it will have 10 different spams joined together. Right, like this. Okay. Um, of course, some of my students will also want to spam by a number of uh, times to break the computer, but try not to, all right, because we are not trying to break the computer. We're just trying to see if it works. How can I duplicate strings with a space between them? 
Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to teach you a very cheap method, which is just to add a space be behind the word. <laughs> this will introduce a space behind every one of them. Okay. It's, it's not very commonly used, I would say, duplication. But sometimes when you are naming your file, you do see some use of this. You're welcome. All right, so let me just cover conditions before we end today's class. Let's just make it a two-hour session, all right, since we went on so fast. Is n function will do the work? Don't really understand your question, Jojo. Okay, so let me move on to conditions. Okay, so tomorrow's class will be on control flow, right, on how we can get the computer to uh, stop or to do something repeatedly, okay, using loops, all right? I can see that some of you actually learn about if, else, and elif, <clears throat> and also your while loop and for loops. Everything will be covered tomorrow. But before we move on to tomorrow, let me cover a bit on conditions, okay? Because everything that you learn tomorrow, you will need to do it with a condition. Okay, what is a condition in computer science, right? Condition is basically a Boolean expression. Right, what do I mean by Boolean expression? Right, remember expression are any line that produces a value, right? If I call it a Boolean expression, that means this line produces a Boolean value. All right, and Boolean value, there's only two types, right? Either true or false. Okay, so to create condition in computer science, right, or in Python, there are actually um, two ways as I can think of, right? There are several ways, I would say, right? And one of the ways is to use your relational operator. Oops. Relational operator. Okay, what's a relational operator? A relational operator is an operator that draws a, that compares two pieces of information, okay? We have learned some of it before in class for sure, right? You have your more than, more than equals, less than, less than or equals to, okay? In your math class, you may have written it like this or like this, okay? But back then when Python was created, these symbols are not available on your keyboard, right? So, no, we don't use that symbol here, right? For greater than or equals to, we use these two symbols to, like, together, right? A more than and an equals to, okay? And then we also have two more, uh, symbol that is your equals to and your not equals to, right? This may be new to some of you, all right? Remember what we mentioned about the equal sign being that it's not an equal sign, right? This is a assignment operator, okay? When you see this, this is me trying to assign something from the right to the left, usually with a variable, right? I assign the value to a certain variable. <clears throat> okay, but when I want to check for equality, right, to check whether the left is equals to the right, I would need to use the double equal sign like this. Okay, remember it's double equal sign. Okay, and if you want to tell the computer to check whether is it not equals to, right, you will use the exclamation mark equals to like this. Okay, so let's do some example over here to demonstrate. <clears throat> I'm going to remove all this. Okay, let's say I have a name that is uh, YY as always, my age is 99. And Emma is male, right? Not, not a name Ismael, uh, but Ismail is me trying to see if I'm a male, right? Obviously I am, so this is gonna be true, okay? So one more thing before I demonstrate, right? Uh, as I go along, I will notice all these little details. When you are coding on Replit, you realize that your variable is actually white in color, your strings is orange in color, your numbers is green in color, and your boolean is blue in color, all right? This is what we call color coding, all right? It's trying to differentiate each and every piece of information with a unique color so that when you have a very long set of code, all right, you'll be able to distinguish these parts easily, right? <clears throat> so that's that. Um, different code editor will have different color coding, all right? If you're using PyCharm, like some of you have suggested in chat, right, it may be a different color, all right? Uh, for me, I use Visual Studio Code. I can change the color as I want, right? I can change the theme, all right? <clears throat> but this is color coding. All right, let's do a bit of relational operator. Okay, so if I were to print 
All right. Whether my name is equals to yy, right? This will give me true. All right. My name is indeed equals to yy. However, if I want to say that my name is not equals to yy, this will return false. All right. Because my name is actually yy. But if you're trying to see, if you're trying to say that name is not equals to yy, this will be false, right? That means you fail to meet this condition, right? The condition is the name must not be yy. But because you fail to meet this condition, it will return false, right? This is me trying to write a condition. All right. And not just <clears throat> this, you can also do bigger than or less than. But then, all right, bigger than and less than. Usually, we don't use it between strings because it doesn't really make sense, but you can still use it. Let me show you how. All right. So let's say if I want to print um, 100 is bigger than H. True. Obviously, because my H is 99. All right. 100 is bigger than 99. Right. This is true. Okay. 100 is bigger than or equals to H. Also true because it is bigger than, right? However, if I do 88, it will return false, right? Simple as that, very simple logic. Now, the problem now is when you want to do a <clears throat> operation between a string and a number, let's say name is greater than or equals to H, all right? When you want to compare YY with 99, all right, and you print it, you will realize that more than or greater than is not supported between instances of string and integer, right? The word instances will, will be explained Saturday, right? But for now, just refer to it as these variable names, all right? When you compare two pieces of information, if it is an integer and a string, right, of different data types, you can only use equals to or not equals to. All right, you cannot use more than, less than, more than equals to or less than equal to, right? It doesn't make sense, okay? However, <clears throat> if you really want to make a comparison between two different strings for whatever reasons, let's say maybe print uh, small letter A is less than capital letter A. All right, when I run this, it's running. It's lagging. Wow, why is it why is it lagging? Okay, right, let's take let's let's check. Let's take a look at the chat. So can you give us homework Python exercise so that we can apply all the concepts? Um there's actually a lot of exercises you can explore on the internet on which field that Python is mostly used. Uh Python is mostly used in data science and machine learning nowadays, not so much on website. However, there are still some website that uses like Python actually. <clears throat> okay, so where we can practice Python, okay, can. I will do recommendation later. Um, yeah, so is capital letter A lesser than big letter A? It is false. Now, why is this false, right? It's actually based on their ordinal position. Okay, this is another detour. Let me just tell you guys this right now. Um, remember, I mentioned something about machine language earlier, right? So machine language is very, uh, how do you say, primeval, right? So it's very bare bones, right? So it's always just zeros and ones. Okay, if you realize, machine language is all about zeros and ones, right? So how would a computer understand these alphabets, right? So. I want you to understand this. Every alphabet or actually every character right, on computer is actually represented by numbers. Okay, every character has its own number, right? Even your emojis have number. All right. <clears throat> so back then the American society actually came out with this code called the ASCII. All right, which is a number that represents each character on the keyboard. But as they grow bigger and bigger, right? You, there's, um, sorry, before this, there were only symbols and 
alphabets and characters, right? But later on, they realized that, hey, it cannot be, uh, we can't be so unfair to the other languages as well, right? We cannot just represent English characters. We need to represent Russia characters. We need to represent Chinese characters. We need to represent Thailand characters, right? Thai characters and um, some of the Burmese characters are all foreign, right? So all these characters need to be represented with a number. And they realized that uh, 8 bit is not enough. So they need to go beyond that, right? <clears throat> So eventually they cut off from ASCII and they come up with Unicode. Okay, so Unicode has a lot of different numbers representing a lot of different characters, right? You have your emojis, you have your Russian characters, French, uh, no, not French characters, um, maybe some of the French characters as well, right? You know, some of the French characters have actually this, all right, or this and stuff, right? So all these characters, all these weird, weird characters are represented by a number. And this number is what we call the ordinal number. <clears throat> what is the meaning of ordinal, right? It's basically just a position, all right? Where are they located, right? So let's just take a quick detour. To check the ordinal of a certain character, you can just use ORD as a function, all right, and check a, let's do A and capital A, okay? I'm gonna print this out to see what are the values that's being held by these particular characters. Okay, so I'm just gonna do print like this. All right, you will see that actually a small letter A is at position 97, whereas a capital letter A is at 65. Okay, so if you look at it uh, on the ASCII table, all right, ASCII table. Mm, let me show you this one. <clears throat> all right, so each and every character, as I mentioned to you earlier, is represented by a, uh, by a number, right? So just look at DEC, which stands for decimal, right? Based, right, there is, Hexadecimal, all right, octo, HTML, don't really care about it, okay? So capital letter A is actually at 65 over here. Sorry, <clears throat> let's see, capital letter A is at 65. Then we have small letter A that's at 97, all right? <clears throat> and of course, because this is just ASCII, all right, there will only be 128 characters, right? Because it starts from zero. Obviously, 128 is not enough to cover all your Chinese characters and stuff, right? So we need to move on to Unicode, right? Unicode is an extension from the ASCII table. So let's say if you're interested to know, all right, what is the character of a certain ordinal number, okay? You can do the reverse of this, right? ORD returns you the ordinal value, okay? Let me just write this down. Returns the all no value of a character, all right? So CHR, on the other hand, returns the character of the specified uh, ordinal number. Okay, so let's say if you are interested to know what is at the, a, sorry, not, C, not char, CHR, what is at the thousandth position, all right? You can do this and you print it. It's actually this, this is not an eight, by the way. This is just a character that looks kind of like eight, all right? And you can go even further than a thousand. I think there's like 10,000, all right? You start to see all these funny, funny symbols, right? Eventually you'll be able to see some Chinese words. Okay, let me see if I can explore some Chinese words here. Oh, I have an arrow, okay? so. You can use CHR to find out uh, the character at a certain ordinal position, or you can use ORD to find out what is the ordinal value of a specific character, right? So it's like we say versa, okay? And yeah, have fun with this. Try to find out all the characters. <laughs> okay, let me just try to find one more. Okay, so this is an unsupported character. That means uh, rapper wasn't able to read this. It's probably a Chinese character or maybe a Korean character, or it may be a Ch Japanese character as well. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so with that said, I think I will just end it here and open the floor up for questions. If any of you have any questions, do let me know. 
Um, if you're looking for exercises, you can easily go up to Google and just find ex Python exercises. And you should have various resources available on the internet. W3 is one of the good ones, right? You can have practice python.com, W3 is good. There are a lot of different resources that you can use to practice your Python on. Where are we supposed to share our codes? You can share it on Slack, I guess. Yeah, Tony is bit, yeah, you can use Tony to practice Python as well. <clears throat> what makes each programming language good for something? Um basically it's how easy it is to how is it built to like how do you call this? It's a tough question to to answer, but it's basically like JavaScript, it's more built for website because it's easier to use. Uh, to build websites and Python is more on the back end, right? JavaScript is more for the front end and what else? And it really depends on the memory management and there's a lot of behind the scenes of the programming language, which is a bit more detailed than what we are exploring right now, right? What we are exploring is more superficial, right? How do we just print stuff? These are all high level commands, right? And what makes a language better for other users may be with the, the backend application of it, right? How it mem how it manages the memory, all right? <clears throat> and stuff like that. Okay, uh, how to use Jupyter? If you want to use Jupyter, there are a few ways. You can either use Anaconda like this, or you can also launch a AWS SageMaker instance, which actually requires you to make payment. If you don't have AWS, Educate yet? <clears throat> Let me see where are the other questions. <clears throat> on Jupyter, you can just click on this launch button over here when you uh, have the Anaconda Navigator installed. Yeah, if you want to use Jupyter Notebook, you can try using Anaconda, Be pretty easy. <clears throat> Basically, any platform that allows you to use Python IDE is good for you. All right, I think Replit is pretty easy to use because you can just create an account and you don't have to install Python on it. You can just run it and you can access it anywhere you want to. After learning Python, can we continue learning AI? Uh, yes, in fact, at the near the end of the camp, there are sessions on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah, so basically the idea is this, right? For the first five to six days, we exp uh, we expose you guys to the fundamentals of Python. And for the following week, my colleague, which is a bit more expertise in machine learning and artificial intelligence, will provide his classes on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, where we'll explore some other modules like Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-learn, uh, TensorFlow, and stuff like that. Deep learning, mm, I don't think they will explore deep learning, but I think it's more on machine learning, not to the extent of deep learning, but I'm not too sure. Yeah, because deep learning is like the subset of machine learning where you have to explore neural networks and stuff, which is like your tensor flow. I'm not sure whether they've covered it, but if you stay around, then you will get to know it. <clears throat> automation. Python can be used for automation, but we are not going to cover how to do that. So time now is 5.58, sorting algorithms. Oh yeah, algorithms will not be covered in this course as well, right? Because algorithms is a bit more advanced and this is as the name suggests, right? Beginner friendly. So we are not going to cover algorithms. We're just going to cover uh, some of the concepts on how to program with Python. So you won't hear things like what? Sif of half blah, 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 blah. Some of the things that I cannot even pronounce properly. How to install Python using pip? Possible to give an overview? Um, not really, because installing Python depends on your operating system, right? But of course, you can search it up on YouTube. I believe there are a lot of tutorials on how you can install Python on your computer. 
depending on your operating system. If you're using Mac OS, the process may be a bit different. If you're using Windows, it may be a bit different as well. Okay. <clears throat> but generally, if I remember correctly, the easiest way is just to install Python in the official website. You can just download Python here. All right. <clears throat> Ta -da, you can just download your Python. <clears throat> so all your different OS is over here, right? Um, and this website is actually programmed in a way that it detects your operating system, right? Let's say, for example, I'm currently using Mac OS. When I go into this website of python.org slash downloads, it will tell me that, hey, my version is Mac OS and I should download this. I should download this instead. All right, so if you're using Windows, when you're in this website, probably it will automatically direct you to a Windows OS version. Why does Python require pip? Pip is more like an installer or a package installer for Python. Okay, remember, um, this is something that we're gonna cover later on as well. It's on the concept of modules, right? Ah, sorry, modules. So, Remember I mentioned something like Python is having a growing community where everyone is trying to use Python to come up with their own set of code. If you want to install these packages that are not originally in Python, right? you need to use pip to actually get their code. So pip is more like a package installer, right? Think of it like a library, okay? If you want to get something from library, you need to go to the library and then borrow it, right? So pip is like a library where you just go there and you tell the library that, hey, I want to pip, install Pygame, all right? Then the computer, as in your computer, will go to the library and install this Pygame module into your own computer. Then you can use it, all right? <clears throat> will the lessons go more advanced in the later sessions? It will go as advanced as object-oriented programming. Okay, so on Saturday, we will reach to a point where you will understand uh, what are clusters? What are instances? Okay, tomorrow we'll be exploring control flow. And the day after tomorrow, we'll be exploring um, data structures like this and dictionaries. All right, so um, I'm, I'm going to 